Today's daf we're going to be learning is Nadarim daf Samach Aleph. I want to remind everybody that we're heavy into our Circle of Friends campaign for 2023. If you haven't yet joined our Circle of Friends, please consider joining a dollar a day, $360 for the year. Um, it enables us to continue to offer our services free of charge to everybody. It is not incumbent upon everyone to join, but we would love it if you joined. If you can give more, that's great. If you can't give $360, any amount that you give, will help us to continue providing all the Torah learning that we are providing to women around the world and to men as well. With that, we're going to get started with our daf. So we're starting at the bottom of Samach, uh, Samach Amud Bet. We had a question. Konam yayin sh'ani to'em yom mai. We already had in the mission, if you say hayom, it's today until the end of the day, until dark. If you say yom echad, 24 hours from whatever time you gave the vow. If you say day, what does that mean? What does day mean? Is it like the day, today? Or is it like one day? So we tried to, to infer it from a Mishnah unsuccessfully. We're now going to start three lines from the bottom. Amar of Sheshet Tashma. Let's learn it from here. He's going to now quote a Mishnah from Daf Samach Gimel. Konam yayin sha'ani to'em hashana. If you say wine will be forbidden to me that I eat this, I drink this year. Nit abra hashana, if it became a leap year, asurba ubi ibura. You can't eat not that year and not on the extra month. Hey, chidami, what exactly is the case? Ilema kedikatani, if it's the simple reading, you said, I won't eat, I won't drink wine this year. And the, and the conclusion is, this year includes the leap year. Of course it includes the leap year. Lama lila mamor, what do you need the mission to tell you this? Because the when you have a leap year, you add another month of Adar, and that's still considered that year. So it's quite obvious. And la lav de amal shana. It must be that you said year without hashana, even though the wording in the mission was hashana. It must be really that you said year. And then alma shana ke hashana dam. Now, why did it say hashana? Because it's telling you shana is like saying hashana. If you say year, it means this calendar year which is going to end at the end of the leap year and not 12 months later. And since Shana is like Hashana, Yom Nami Kehayom Dine. So then Yom is like Hayom, to which the which would mean that you end up saying until the end of that particular day and not 24 hours, to which the Gemara rejects this proof and says, no, lo, la olam da'amal Hashana. No, the Mishnah said Hashana, it meant Hashana. You said it's obvious? Well, I'll tell you why they needed to tell you this. You might have thought, maybe when you say this year, it means like most years. First of all, when you got up and said this year, it, you might not have even known yet it was going to be a leap year, especially in the days when they hadn't determined that in advance. So maybe you really only meant until the end of the first Adar. Maybe that was your intention, like most years end at the first of Adar. Well, Kamash Malan comes to teach you, we don't say that. Year is whenever the year actually ends. If they add an extra month, it's going to include that extra month, in which case we have no answer to our question. So we don't really know what yom means. She's going to make this next question a little bit complicated because he buy a lihu. Now they ask another question. Amal yayin shani to'em yovel ma. If you say, I won't drink wine, yovel. Now you didn't say ha yovel, although the question is really going to sound like, and most of the commentaries say it must be that you said Hayovel, this jubilee season, meaning until this jubilee year. Because Yovel, it would be a question, did you mean 50 years starting now or until the end of, right, until the Yovel comes in this next, right, until the closest Yovel arrives. Now, that's not the Gemara's question. So it must be, and the Mufreshman explained, we must be talking about Hayovel because otherwise it doesn't make sense. So let's just assume it means this jubilee cycle, right? Which means until, right, let's say you're in year 35, till you get to year 50. Well, now here comes the question. Where does the jubilee year go? Usually you count seven cycles of seven years to year 49, and then you have the 50th year. Not usually, that's how it works. So now the question is, is the 50th year considered the end of this jubilee cycle, and that's included in what you said? Or is it considered more like the beginning of the next and it's not included? So now if I would ask you, what would you say? Of course, you almost the 50th, right? And the next year, 
counts, right, is the first year of the next Shemitah cycle. And it goes seven cycles of seven years, year 50, and then it starts again, seven cycles of 50 years, year 50, uh, 49, of uh, seven cycles of seven years now, and then year 50. But we're going to learn in a minute that that's actually not necessarily true. Okay, there's a debate about this. So which the Gemara answers, Tashma, let's learn it from here, Ditanya, Plukta, de Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbana. This actually, where the Yovel year comes, is it considered the last year or the 50th, and it's kind of not included in any count? And then you start the following year with one, which is what you would have thought. Or is the Jubilee year actually the first year of the next cycle as well? It's also considered 50 to the previous, but it also, you already start counting year one of the next Shemitah cycle. And the Jubilee year is year one of the Shemitah cycle. It sounds like a weird opinion. And in fact, the rabbis are going to say this doesn't make any sense but Rabbi Huda is going to support his opinion. So how does it work? You should sanctify the, the 50th year. So now they say this counts as year 50. This really means you don't count the 50th year as year number one. This is what we would have assumed. That's Rabbanat. From here they learn, doesn't count as a year in one of these seven year Cycles. Rabbi Yehuda Omel, Yovel Olen Minyan Shavua. It is counted as part of the seven year cycles, meaning it counts already as year number one. So it's both year 50 and year one. Abu Rula, Rabbi Yehuda, they said to him, How could that possibly be? From the Torah, it's clear it's not. For six years, you plant. Now, in the Jubilee year, you don't work the land. So you can't say it's part of the six years where you're supposed to be working the land. It can't be year number one. Year number one is a year where you work the land. The Torah says you work the land for six years and then you rest on the seventh. In that cycle, right, there'll be seven cycles of seven years. In the first cycle, you won't actually be working for seven years, uh, for six years. Amar Lahem, he says to them, that's not a good proof against my opinion because I'll take, I'll take it farther. According to you, then, this pasuk makes no sense. Torah says, what happens if you say, how on earth could I keep Shemitah? In the end, right, I'm going to have nothing to live off. So Torah tells us that God is going to give you a blessing, and he's going to bless the year for three years. What three years? Year six, because you're six, right? In other words, it's not that he's going to bless it, but that you're, he's going to bless the land that it's going to produce for three years. First is the first year you plant in this year six, you're going to have crops from year six. Then you're going to have crops in year seven that grew right from the blessing and crops in year eight, because year eight, you're only going to start planting, right? And you're going to, you're going to need the blessing of God also to that in year eight, things are going to grow properly. So now, according to you, arba, there should be four because and when there's a jubilee year, you're going to need an extra year because the eighth year, you're not planting either. You're going to need it to the bracha to go into the ninth year. So, this, this pasuk, and, and my pasuk as well, the one you questioned me with, is talking about in the other. There's six out of seven cycles, this will be the case. So the Torah just didn't relate to the one time where there's a jubilee year. And therefore, that's not a question against me. So you haven't disregarded me, right? So just like the one about the, the three years is normally it's three years in the regular Shemitah cycle when it's not a Jubilee year. Likewise, Dili Nami, the one you put against me, the Sheshanim, is also it's when the, all the other cycles. Until Pesach, now we're back to the Mishnah. If you say until Pesach, it's forbidden until Pesach, before Pesach. If you say, ad lifneha Pesach, they didn't quote this now, but this is what they're talking about. You say until before Pesach, then it's forbidden, according to Rabbi Meir, until before Pesach. And according to Rabbi Yossi, the word lifne doesn't really mean necessarily before. It might mean lifnot as it's ending. So it might mean the end. So therefore, you're forbidden until the end. The main one, so now the Gemara wants to say, are you going to assume that now we're going to explain what's the root of the debate. And then they're going to say that actually stands in total contradiction to something that appears elsewhere where each one takes the opposite side of the debate. So let's explain. We actually saw this already on Daf Yud which was, Rabbi Meir must hold that what? People don't put themselves in a doubt 
a situation of doubt. What does that mean? It means if I'm taking a vow and I'm going to say something's forbidden and what I say could actually be explained in one way definitively and for something, there's part of it that might be not clear. Okay, one of the cases we saw was if you say something about an animal, okay, an undomesticated animal, which there's a debate about a koi, whether a koi is an undomesticated or a domesticated animal. So if I say chaya, which is an undomesticated animal, am I including koi? So if we hold like Rabbi Mayer here, who says, no, people don't put themselves in a doubtful situation. Therefore, if I use the word chaya, I only meant definite chayot and not ones that are maybe domesticated, maybe non-domesticated, because I wouldn't put myself in a situation where I might have to forbid something out of a doubt. So therefore, if I said until before Pesach, which could be translated as before the end of Pesach, you know, as it ends, since be- the whole time period before Pesach is definitive, and once Pesach starts, it's questionable. I didn't mean to put myself in that questionable situation. And I clearly meant the meaning of it being before Pesach, because that's clear. Now we're on Amabit. Rabbi Yossi Sabah, Ma'ayalim Ishnafsha the Sveka, he says, no, people do put themselves in a doubtful situation. I, I don't mind. I said something that's ambiguous. So I got I got to suffer a little, you know, uh, the whole thing is going to be forbidden because people do say things that could potentially be understood in other ways. And they're willing to take upon themselves any chumra, any strangers say they're going to have to as a result. So if that's the, what we're assuming the debate is about, well, that raises a problem, a contradiction with another source, Uruminhi. It says in Kiddushin, Let's just assume. A man marries a woman, they have two daughters, then he, then she dies. He marries someone else, and they have two daughters. So now, he has two groups of two daughters. And what's important to remember here, I specifically gave that example because the two daughters from the second wife are younger than the two daughters from the first one. And he said, and here you're going to see it's the same issue, even though it wasn't a vow. This is just in general. Do people make statements that are going to get them into difficult situations? So he said, Kidashi Epitigdola, I betrothed my oldest daughter. Now, or older daughter. Did he mean the oldest of them all, the first daughter of the first wife? Or Imgidola Shebiktanot, or it could be the oldest daughter of the second wife. Even it could be the younger of the two from the first wife. She because she's older. Then, right, it's all relative. She's older than the other two from the other wife. So therefore, they're all forbidden, according to Rabbi Meir, other than the very youngest, because she for sure is not older than anybody. But all the other three theoretically are older, either the oldest of the second two, the oldest of all of them, or the oldest of, you know, that she's older than the other two. So Rabbi Yossi Omel, and now that means what? That when he said it, he was willing to make it, you know, he made a statement that was unclear and he was willing to open up the possibilities that he might have to be stripped. Now, what does it mean they're all asurot? It means none of them can go get married unless they get divorced because they're all, all three out of the four, right? So those three are potentially maybe married. We don't know, maybe betrothed, not married, but betrothed. They would have to get divorced from the betrothal. So he would have to give a get to two out of the three women. Rabbi Yossi Omel, you know, he could stay married to one of them. Rabbi Yossi Omel, kulan mutarot, chutz min hagdola shebigdolot. Oh, the truth is, now that I'm thinking about it, you actually have a problem. No, they're all asurot, right? Because you have a problem. We learned this in Yibum. If he was theoretically married to her sister, he can't marry the sister. So he actually can't stay married to any one of them. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Kulan Mutarot. They're all permitted. Chutz min hagdola shebigdolot. Obviously, when he said older, he meant the oldest of all of them. And because people don't put themselves in a situation where, oh, maybe there's a doubt here about something. So therefore, they're all permitted. Amar Rabbi Chanina Bar Abdimi Amar Shita. So in order to resolve this difficulty, that Rabbi Yossi sides on the other side of the debate, then he sides in our Mishnah, and Rabbi Meir is on the other side of the debate, then he is in our Mishnah, they say, ah, switch the opinions in our mission. And then it all fits in perfectly with that mission in Ketubo, uh, in Kedushin. And in fact, we have a source to prove this because it says, Hatanya Zehakla. The, there's a uh, mission that says, this is the rule. Uh, Brighton says, this is the rule. 
Kosha's mano kavua. Okay, we're going to get to this in the next mission. That there's a difference between things that have a set time, like Pesach comes out the same time, every, right, same date every year. We know when it is. We know how long it is. If the time is set, v'amar ad lifne, and he said until before. Rabbi Meir Romer ad shietze. Rabbi Meir says lifne means until the end of the holiday, until it finishes, which is the opposite of what Rabbi Meir said in our Mishnah. Rabbi Yossi says it's until the beginning, and that matches perfectly with switching the opinions in our Mishnah, which then would work perfectly with what we saw in Kiddushi. New Mishnah. Okay, apropos this issue of Kavuazman or not Kavuazman, now we're going to talk about things that don't have a set time. So if you say it's going to be forbidden to me until the harvest, which is the harvest of the grapes, the Katsir is the harvest of the grains, Adamasik is the harvest of the olives. It's only forbidden until the beginning of it. Here's the rule. If it has a set time, like Pesach, for example, and you said, it's only up until the beginning, before. If you say until it is, then you have to do it till the very end. But we're going to distinguish between that and something that doesn't have a set time. Ben Amal, now there's a debate about whether we mean it doesn't necessarily start at the same time, because you know the harvest, the harvest of your crops could be different every year. Obviously not majorly different, but somewhat different. And really, most of the commentaries say we're really talking about the end date. If something has, we're not sure when it's going to end, then it could go on for a really long time and we just it doesn't really have an end in sight. So therefore, they distinguish and they say clearly when you took a vow, you didn't mean for it to go on who knows how long, right? If you say until the end of Pesach, so we assume you know exactly when Pesach is going to end. So that's a definitive date. You could say something like that. But if you have no idea, then we assume no. So kol she'ens mano kavua, bein amal ad bein amal ad shi'egia. So if it doesn't have a set time, let's just assume we go by the commentaries that say an end date of time. Some people say even the beginning date. We'll go with the end date. Then, it doesn't matter what language you use, we're going to basically say it's only until the start date and not until the end date. Until now. Kayets usually means summer. What they mean here is the time of picking of the figs. So, okay, if you say or until it will be, which sounds usually like when it's finished, but no, because it's not a set time. So, how do we determine when the time is for picking the figs? It's when the people start putting them into baskets. If you say until it's finished, now then you're very clear, then you really have to wait till the end. Now the question becomes, how do you determine when it's the end of the season? Once they start folding up or, or putting away, here there's a debate what this is, folding up sounds more like the opinion that it's mats, they would dry them on mats. So it's not just picking them, it's also drying them. Some people say it's these knives that they would hide after they would put them away for the next season because they would dry them, then they would cut them, which is a later stage. And then they would cut them with these special knives and then they would put the knives away for the next season. So once you kind of fold up all your paraphernalia that goes with it, all your work utensils, then it shows the season is over. Again, a bit of a debate what exactly this these utensils are. Tana. So now the Gemara quotes a Brayta. Now I said this was all figs, based on what the Gemara is going to say right here. But actually, the mission never mentioned figs; just said kites. But kites usually means figs, and that's why I said figs. And also, the Gemara says the the Brayta that we're quoting in the Gemara says that we're talking about figs and not grapes. Tanya, but there's another Brayta that says no If you say from the summer fruits, which again relates to this word kites, has to do with picking the figs. We only mean figs. Rashbag says no. Grapes are included as well. So he has a different approach. Why does he hold no? Because you pick them by hand. That's why he assumes that kites from the shan of the ksots to cut and, and cut like pluck, pluck with your hands. Therefore, it must be relating to figs. Anavim, lomakat sambiyada, and grapes we don't cut with our hands, and that's why they're not included. So what about Rashbag? Why does he think grapes are included? Rashbag sabal, anavim nami, ki meradadan, mikatsatsambiyadi. Sometimes when the anavim are meradadan, now there's many interpretations, some people even have a bit of a different word here, whether it's that the 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 once the 
the branches dry out, once the liquid starts coming out of the grapes, once something happens at some later stage when the grapes are very ripe, then you actually could pull them off with your fingers and people do that. And therefore, kites would then include anavim as well, according to Rashbak. Okay, we'll start with that tomorrow, where they're now going to talk about that, that sentence in the Mishnah, and we'll deal with that tomorrow. Wishing everybody a Hanukkah Sameach.